All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to our first episode of Voices with VIPs. VIPs, of course, being visual impairments professionals. And our first VIP that we have today is Robin Clark, and she is Principal Assistant Director um, at Utah Schools for the Deaf and Blind. Um, Robin, I got your title right. Is that right? About it. It works. Yeah. I'm at the okay. school. I love it. It's all good. All right. Cool, cool, cool. Um, and before we get started, Robin and I have known each other for quite a long time. Um, uh, she, when I was actually being serviced as a student with a visual impairment in Connecticut, um, Robin was one of my service providers. So it's really funny how the, the field kind of comes full circle, doesn't it? Um, so uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll start kind of just, Robin, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about the uh, position, your position at the school and what do you do and uh, what kind of is your vision there? Okay, well, I am excited to be here, and yeah. it is exciting that, you know, Cody is, is totally a colleague, but there is that special little part that if I could show a different picture in my background, you'd probably see a picture of, like, <laughs> teenager Cody uh, in the background as I... Yeah, we I've don't want to see that. Yeah, so. <laughs> little around there. Um, but Robin Clark, I am at the Utah School for the Deaf and the Blind. I've been here almost eight years. I used to be at the Services for the Blind in Connecticut. Um, and my, my role, if you've never met me, um, is really all things expanded core curriculum. I like to call myself an enthusiast of the expanded core because, you know, obsessed has a really bad connotation uh, to think. <laughs> um, but at the school, I am the team lead assistant, assistant director of the expanded core division and then um, assistant principal in our Bridges program, which is our high school college prep or post high, and then our residential program. So I get to supervise that instruction there and then get to have a lot of really awesome expanded core teaching opportunities with students all over Utah. So a lot of expanded core, a little administration, and I love being a teacher, which is why I never want to be a full administrator. Awesome. I, I feel you on that one about being the administrator and actually getting to work with our students. Um, yeah. And, and uh, so before we kind of dive into our questions, I'll kind of uh, talk to our audience here um, and kind of how these work. We have um, a couple of our IT team members um, here on the call as well. Um, and they are actually monitoring the Facebook Live chat and the Facebook Live uh, feed. So if you do have any questions for me or for Robin, uh, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, and then throughout the, the feed, um, I'll be asking our, um, our social media guy, Kamran, he's, he's going to be reading us our live chat. So feel free to ask us any questions throughout. We love going on tangents. Um, we don't have to st stick to a script at all. So um, just for you all. And uh, kind of the first thing that I say um, to our audience is just tell us where, where you're coming from. I know that this is we, we service, you know, people across the country and other countries. We want to know where you're coming from, uh, where you're joining us from. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. Put that in the chat. So I'll jump kind of back to our questions. And, and Robin, obviously, you know that at IT, we're very focused on technology, which is one small part of the ECC. Um, and uh, with that, I know you and I have had a lot of conversations about this, but I want you to tell everybody what, what role do you think technology and uh, screen readers specifically play in the success of our students and, and how that plays into our larger um, ECC. Sure. And, you know, I, I just, for everybody to know, I am going to watch how long I give these answers because <laughs> I think every single question on this list are all things that touch my like passion points. So I want to say everything about it. But if I had to boil this down and really get clear about it, Technology is an opportunity without, without, without hesitation. I would say that it's the opportunity for the next step. And before we kind of keep feeding this myth that technology is everything, technology is a vehicle, but it won't do the job by itself. So first and foremost, I think it's really important that students have base skills. And what I mean when I say base skills, I mean problem solving, critical thinking, evaluating, right? Because as all of us have learned or will learn, it doesn't matter how fancy this device is, how many wonders it can do for us, if we don't know how to use it and leverage what that can do for us, then it's just a great piece of technology that was really expensive. Mm 
So the first thing I want to say is keep that in mind. Technology is a vehicle. It's a vehicle and it's an opportunity that allows our students and, and really any person with a vision impairment to come closer to their skills, to further where they'd like to go. Um, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm a new convert to the tech game. Um, and we'll talk about this in some other questions, but um, some people come out of the field like tech ready and, and not that I was a bad person, I was, I was pretty awesome. But just kind of timeline, like when Cody was a student or some of the other ones 10 years ago, I was okay. I had some apps. I remember when the iPhone came out for students with vision impairments. And I wanted to share this because I'm sure there's many professionals who are in my, my timeline. It wasn't part of my college prep career, right? Um, we didn't have computers even. Um, anyways, but <laughs> the point is, is that I'm a late convert, a late adopter, and I was intimidated because I knew it was important. I was a <laughs> really into saying shut up a lot to JAWS because I couldn't ever get it to work. Um, and then I, I, had a, I had a shift a couple of years ago, and this kind of sums up the rest of my answer is, again, technology was cool. It did cool things. And then I started to really see the opportunity that technology provided. And I, do, and I, although screen readers are a big part of it, apps, iPhones, iPads, low tech, high tech, wow. Instead of having one cool thing that was bulky and big, any low vision student who grew up in the 90s probably has a story about their CCTV and that, <laughs> that one there, Cody's got a hand up. Yep, that's um, right. But that was the main one. And now video magnifiers, pocket magnifiers, Wow. Wow. So how do I think of technology? A vehicle, a vehicle to move forward. But again, just like any other vehicle, if you don't know how to drive, it doesn't do anything for you. But when you realize what it can do, then that's, that's really worth it. And some students might only be driving ever on a dirt road or, you know, somewhere easy. And, and many, many students, many young adults will move on to wanting to be on the freeway, but technology allows you to get on the freeway and to stay with peers, colleagues, coworkers, and have access to what everybody else is getting as long as everybody keeps making things accessible. Yeah. I love that. I think, um, Honestly, I, I, I think that a lot of people think of technology as a subject, and I mm -hmm. guess we, we kind of categorize that in classes as a subject, but um, we never get on our computers in the morning just to play on our computers, right? We get on our computers to check email and to communicate with colleagues and to write documents. And um, I think that, especially, I think what, what we get into a, a lot too, which you kind of touched on is like, students will start to use technology and then be like, what am I using this for? Like, am I using this just to be in technology class? And that's, that's not the answer. It's to, it's like you said, it's one part of a whole, um, a part that might be lacking, but a part that, that we need to make sure that we're, we're kind of realizing that it's a part of a bigger picture. So I like that a lot. Um, and then also, yeah, go ahead. Jump in, Cause you said yeah. something really great about, cause technology is also a big time waster. Mm. And it's easy yeah, for somebody to observe a student. And I, I think this is really critical. It's easy to observe a student who can get on their phone and access Facebook and go, they know technology. Right. So let's be real clear and let's be, a, a, let's be awake on this. Just because a student can jump on their phone and send a text message doesn't mean they're proficient to have a meaningful job and to have quality of life. So right. as we're doing this, because we've all been there, we've all come into the, the, you know, I only meant to look at this one video and now two hours later, <laughs> here I still am. So it's really great points. I'm glad you brought that to me. Just because you can see a student do one thing on one device does not mm -hmm. mean they are fluent and proficient in what they really need in today's ever-changing 21st century society. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's a great example of like knowing to use your phone, but can you sit on a computer and, and write a document? Those are two different skills. And knowing like you saying a student that is good with technology doesn't necessarily mean they can do everything, you know? So there's always always room to grow and it's always a part of a bigger picture. I love that. Um, 
Cool. So I, I guess, and you kind of touched on this in your last answer too, but what do you think the hardest part of teaching technology to students with visual impairments is? Um, and then how can we kind of work to overcome that? Okay. So again, oh my gosh, another passion point uh, question. Um, and, and this is in no particular order, my answer, but it's the things that come to me first. One of the hardest parts, because um, I think to say the hardest is misleading. There, there, are, there are a few barriers, but I believe that they are barriers that we can break. And the first one is not starting early enough with technology opportunities. Um, there's a lot we need to teach our young learners, um, but let's be real. Let's walk into a kindergarten class and watch them. And I have the privilege of having, um, I have an elementary child, I have high schoolers. So I, I really have a great pulse on what they're doing. And as early on as kindergarten, my, my little one could pull up an iPad, open up a learning, a whole system. Nearpods answer the question, even though she couldn't type, knew how to hit the button, record her voice, submit her answer entirely on her own. Um, kindergarten, right? Kindergarten. So technology has to be introduced and nobody is saying give a first grader a screen reader lesson, but the building blocks to technology are right around us. Cause and effect toys, um, keyboarding, posture, awareness of things, knowing the names of things. So the first one, we're not getting tech enough because there are sighted counterparts. They are digital natives, right? I am a digital immigrant. I have immigrated to this land of technology and I've learned, but our, our young students today are natives. How do we ensure that our young students, whether they have significant visual impairments, um, low vision, that we are helping them along, that they are also natives to this world? Because in today's world, it is. So much of it has a, has a thread of technology. Um, so start younger, introduce it, open it up. If you're not sure what to do, anything. Really, isn't that almost an easy answer? If I had to give you a simple answer, do anything right? On the iPad, even if you're doing this, so if you're a mom, if you're a teacher, whoever you are, open the iPad, just one example, right? And start doing something with that student, right? Put on auditory stories and have a student listen to a story and then tell you critical parts. That's a feeder skill to being able to use a screen reader. Did you know that? You got to be able to listen to what Jaws is saying if you're going to make it do something. So, building up that auditory comprehension, maybe picking up the speed a little bit and helping them along. Okay, moving on. Cause that's, that was the first part and I, I'm watching the time. That's okay. Um, I, I do really love the, um, the uh, I, I know you've told me this before and I love the analogy of the digital immigrant, digital native, because you really think about like kids are not, you know, you walk into a second grade classroom and they're not writing pencil paper anymore. They're on Chromebooks and they're on Canvas. And if our students have never had experience with that, you know, what are we doing? You know, Even um, if so I really love that. Um, Absolutely. In, in, in my preschool class, I, I have a preschool class that I, I teach and we have a smart board and <laughs> even my students who have no vision know to come to that board and tap on it. What have I done in the past? I can make a little cut out and tape it to the board. So you always have to hit that spot. Again, knowing how it works, the cause and effect. We, we can start little, I even buy those little VTech toys, right? They, and I don't remember toys being that cool when I was a kid that young, but, but today's little tech toys really are little awesome tech toys. Yeah. So, so again, teachers, and, and I, I know we probably have a lot of our folks in the field, but general ed teachers, just bringing that exposure to them, right? Even as simple as plugging iPads in. And I'm saying a lot with iPad, we can, we can talk about keyboards. Kids love to just hit the keyboard and make sounds. I bring in keyboards that have no, they're not connected to anything, but we pretend to be typing. Again, how do I, and I'm, and I'm showing in the camera how my fingers type. That's something that you can do. How does a mouse work, right? Um, bringing in these pretend items, General ed teachers, you don't need to wait for the specialized teacher to bring about these concepts. Following commands, precision commands. 
that is actually a precursor to our students learning technology, right? When I say file, you say open. How do we open it? <laughs> file, open. All kinds of things that don't require as much as you think to start bringing that awareness, which leads to my second big thing that I think is a hard part for everybody, fear. And, and I'll, I'll continue to talk about this because I, I, I was, and sometimes still am, fearful, not knowing. You don't know how to get started. You feel stuck. You don't know how to use the technology. Again, have you mastered how to do a rotor on the iPad? Do you know where to click on something? Um, so what I say to that is acknowledge it. Acknowledge that you might be intimidated or you might be fearful of this tech. And I'm going to talk about this later. Well, what's one thing that you can do, right? What we, you, you can't dispel fear in one swoop, right? Don't jump off a bridge if you're afraid of heights in one false swoop, but go higher a little bit more. So teachers, stop hiding that you're afraid or you're intimidated. Stop hiding that you don't know because before we didn't have resources, but today we do. When I first started on the Braille Note Touch, which was another piece of technology that I was awful at and intimidated, right? I had to know my computer. I, there were so much, so many things I needed to know in one moment. I put on social media on my little Nine More Than Core Instagram. I said, I'm starting to learn how to use the Braille Note Touch. Who can give me tips? Who can help me? And People I didn't know gave me resources, YouTube channel videos, offering to meet with me. I put my fear out there. I acknowledged I didn't know it. And I received in return people that did resources and support. So what are manageable steps, right? Because there are more technical things that we could be doing. But what are manageable steps that we can do today? Think of all of our students at the kindergarten level. Multiple impairments, typically developing, CVI, what have you, think of all of them. There is no law that says technology is just for typically developing students. Cause and effect can work for kids who have significant multiple impairments. And just say, what can I start doing? What, what learning conditions can I help create in their environment that bring about the threads of technology. What are they? And with a conversation that we can have later, if you want more ideas, I've got some, but start there, creating conditions for learning. Second, embrace your fear, own it and reach out. We're not, we're, even though some of you might be rural teachers, cause I know we're here, right? I know you're here. I know you're in Nebraska. I know you're in Montana. I know you're in the Dakotas. You might feel alone. But honestly, even if you're not a big fan of social media, join the Facebook groups for teachers and say, is anybody willing to jump on Zoom with me? What's a YouTube video? And you're not as isolated or as alone as it really did feel um, a couple of years ago. I think those are two easy things that we could do that honestly, I really feel make a big difference. Absolutely. I, I love that. Yeah. And really, um, I mean, we've all felt that fear, right? Like, I, I know that like, for example, I, I specialize in technology, but when I go out into the field and I get a kid with CVI, I'm like lost, right? Like I need that help too, right? It's not, it's not that we're all out here on Facebook and we know all of the things. It's, it's that we're out here on Facebook and we're saying, hey, guess what? We don't know everything either. And we just wanna share the little piece, the little tiny piece that, I, that I've studied I want to share that resource with you. And hopefully there's somebody out there that's like, oh, there's a little piece that I know and let me share it with me, you know? And, um, and I, I love that. I think it's, it's really, like you said, it's really hard as a teacher to admit you don't know everything, right? Um, but it's really, I think, especially our students, when, when I admit to my students that, hey, guess what? I'm, I'm learning too. It, it opens up that channel for learning and the, and the student kind of relaxes. You feel them relax too. So I love that. Um, I, think come on. Oh, go ahead. I think we should normalize professional development and Absolutely. it's hard because the team, all of these people at this general ed elementary school, they've never had a student with a vision impairment. And now they look at you full spotlight, cue it right yes. now. 
fix everything, do the, do the technology, do the accessibility, do this, do that. And it's easy to then go, what? I haven't had a kid who has done, you know, chemistry and braille in like 10 years. And now I have this kiddo, what? So let's, let's normalize professional development and normalize leveraging resources, right? And saying, you know what? I need to think about who might know that, what resources are available and, and, and be okay, right? I'll be the first one to tell you, I'm not always great with Braille. Actually, my students will be the first one to tell you that. Um, I'm not always great with this, but I've put it out there. So if I want to get help, now everybody knows where they can help me. My students know, we're going to help you with what that contraction is, Robin. You probably don't know it, right? Or you, <laughs> or you mess it up all the time. But I put it out there as a way to receive what I need because nobody likes to hold on. I know now we're a little emotional here, but I know, no, but it's, it's a stress. You're a single itinerant teacher. You've got a big mm. caseload. You've got to become a jack of all trades. We'll come to a place where you can put some of that down and say, I'm going to need some help. And, and ultimately now administrators need to be involved. Stop treating all of these teachers like they're like, the magnificent and get us the professional development that we need. Get us the devices to practice on. Maybe it's not feasible and it's not for every TVI to get a Braille Note Touch Plus, a new iPad, a screen, you know, all these things. But what can you give us, right? So administrators, or I'm saying this so that a TVI can show it to an administrator, <laughs> right? Say we need these devices so that our teachers can check them out, learn the skills, learn it, because they need it to, in order to teach. You can't, yes. you can't catch a fish if you don't even know where the pole is or how it works. So yes. let's start equipping our teachers. And that's what it really means to support our teachers. And that needs to come from administration. Yeah, and I like, <laughs> sorry. I like, no, that's okay. I like, and I like how you're, you're saying professional development, but you're saying like professional be development is not just going to a conference. It's also having a device to learn on, which is, which is an, another huge point that people don't really think of, which is, which is awesome. Um, Kamran, do we have any, any questions in the chat or anything that um, is interesting that people want to share? Um, yes, we do actually have a question from Corey Kirkwood and it's directed towards Robin. And he asks, as you're already aware, there are some TVIs that grew up without technology of today. How do you think we could bridge the gap and teach the TVIs alongside children with vision impairments? And a follow-up question to that is, should screen readers become a standard in technology? Ooh, wow. ending <laughs> with a question. Um, <laughs> let me go to the first one, right? Because I would actually consider myself more on the the veteran, the older side of, of things. Again, wasn't a lot of assistive technology when I was, <laughs> when I was there. Um, I share this a lot with people and I won't go to, into all the details of it, but I will tell you, everybody needs to read the forward to the national agenda. And I hope when I say national agenda, you, you know what that means if you're in our field. No shame or blame if you don't, but do a Google and do it now. Well, in 10 minutes, okay. But in the foreword to the national agenda, it says in there that we must have high expectations of our students, of ourselves, and our programs. If we want students to fully participate in today's mainstream society, then we need to have these expectations, which include skills and development. Now, that means we need to have this. So embrace that fear, but I'll be, you know what, if I could just be super honest, maybe blunt, if you're a teacher of students with vision impairments in today's world, and you're like, technology is not important, you are fooling yourself. That's a lie. We need it. It was included. And remember, when was the national agenda written? When did the expanded core curriculum come out? It wasn't yesterday. We're on the heels of like a 20 year situation, right? Some of you watching were born the year the expanded core curriculum came out, okay? And they still included assistive technology, which says to us that this must be something important. And back then, Phil and everybody doing it, they couldn't foresee an iPad and what a game changer, an iPad or a video magnifier or the Mantis device could be for our students. 
So what would they say now, knowing everything that we have? So a quick answer, because I just gave a long one. Um, <laughs> What would we say to our teachers? Again, we need to start building communities of practice for our teachers. The problem, I think one of the barriers we face as, as teachers of students with vision impairments, especially our itinerant folks, you're alone. You're not usually managed by somebody that understands your needs. Your administrator's not sure. Those are barriers that may never change. You're always gonna have a big caseload. You're always gonna have a big caseload. But that doesn't mean we have to keep a approaching things the same way. It's time to have a new mindset. It's time to build communities of practice. So maybe you are that teacher who knows tech really well and you've got four teachers that don't. What can you offer? Can you offer study buddies? Can you offer classes where you allow your those comrades to come in and be with you? How do we build communities of practice? It's proven. Professional learning communities are proven to be effective, not just for teacher outcomes and teacher development, but for student outcomes. If we want to see some better student outcomes, let's have some better professional learning communities for our teachers. Watching the time, making sure I don't go on there. Uh, and then the, the, the last one, wait, I, I've even kind of forgotten. I just, oh, screen readers, should it be a standard? I'm with you. <laughs> You know what? If I had to say something, I would say yes, right? And and I say that as a as a mid mid level tech tech person now. I did have the great opportunity to serve on the National Tech Standards Committee. There's some great competencies that came out. It came out through Perkins. Get your hands on it, guys. It's really good. It's free, free. Yeah, because I'm, I'm not anti device. I I think the Braille Note Touch is great. But what do you do when VR maybe won't pay for it or you live somewhere and it's not there or your braille note touch breaks and for whatever reason, you don't have a cool five grand, no offense to the price, but you can't get those things. You can always access a laptop, right? You can check it out. You can go to the library and use a laptop. And really thanks to IT, um, you don't always need JAWS. You can use NVDA. Chromebooks are in a lot of places now. So yes, I do think screen readers competencies should be a standard because it's not like it was a fad, right? It's not a bad haircut that's going away. <laughs> it's they're, they're here. And before it was, it was hard to get your hands on a screen reader. At least I, that's how I remember it. Absolutely. But, but now just the price, right? right like it, it was just so unattainable for mm -hmm. them. Um, but now, now it's accessible. And if we can equip our students to have that, they can go to their college library, the local library, anywhere, jump on a, a computer, maybe a little extra effort, I'm not gonna lie. Mm -hmm. But they know how to use a laptop and because they have screen reader skills, they can still move forward. And that's our goal. Yeah, I agree, obviously, but I agree with you for sure. Um, yeah, and it's it's really it's really a great time, I think, it's a great time to be in the vision field because even like, even when I started in the vision field, it was like, we were just on the cusp of this, like NVDA was still kind of new and Chromevox didn't really work very well. And we kind of always just went to JAWS, right? And the iPad, you know? And then the Braille Note Touch comes out and then NVDA gets a little bit bigger and it becomes a more robust screen reader. And then Chromevox comes out with Chromevox next. And all of a sudden, we're, you know, five years later, we're like in this like renaissance of assistive technology that we have never really experienced before. And it's, I think screen, re and now with, with COVID, right, everybody went home and now everything is online. Um, it's like, we can't, can't sit in the dark anymore. You know, it's here, right? It's here to stay for sure. We need um, to keep pushing for the accessibility piece, immersive yes. readers being built in on everything, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we might be the lowest incident disability that's accessing this learning platform, that, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't be universally accessible. So Absolutely. That, that's, that's definitely a big thing that we need to stay on top of. We're not separate, but equal. Mm -hmm. Universal design is important. And um, 
Dr. Ting uh, from San Francisco, sorry, I always call her Ting, um, from San Francisco State, she, met, she made this statement to me and she said, in, in, a, in a thing that we did, and she said, you know, think of it, not so much of assistive technology, but access technology. Mm -hmm. And that was such a game changer. So yes, screen readers getting this accessibility, but but let us keep our foot on the gas about pushing these app develop these, I don't know what you even call them, app developers and, and all of these people universal design matters. And until we get it, we're not going to stop asking for it. Um, and just because you put an icon that said it reads to you, why don't you have a right. real blind person check that? Because right. it is like 40% right. of the document. Yeah. Yeah. Just because you can make the text a little bit bigger doesn't mean that it's screen reader accessible, right? Yeah. But, but okay, knowing, cool. that, knowing how we do it. Yeah. 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 Um, let me switch gears because I want to, I want to, um, get people to know kind of what you guys are doing at Utah specifically. Um, there's, there's so many programs that you guys are doing the cohort program. Um, I know that you're working in your, in your bridges program mm -hmm. and you're working um, on a kind of cool initiatives there. You want to tell us a little bit about, about some of those initiatives that you guys are starting and, and um, maybe how we can replicate that other places. Oh, absolutely. And I hope to hope to even share this with you. So um, the first one I want to talk about is the AT cohort. And this was started because, you know, much like a lot of places, um, we only have maybe one or two assistive technology specialists who can who can handle all these things. And I got to give some kudos to our AT guys, um, Quinton and Wayne, because I have a lot of crazy ideas. And they, they went with it. And one of the things that we, we developed is the AT cohort. And part of the, the barrier for assistive technology teachers and teaching everybody is how to teach so many varied learners how to use this. And, and I, I say this, like I'm not paid or compensated. I found the IT course. I, I saw when Cody launched it, I, somehow I got in when he was just getting it off the ground. And I was like, this could be really cool. And a lot of our AT, a, a big part of our AT cohort in the teaching, that's what we use. So we, um, every, every teacher gets their own license and they have to go through all the modules um, from IT. Um, and again, and I'm honestly saying this, I'm not compensated other than like a smile from Cody. Um, <laughs> It was, it is. Other than being on our Facebook group. Yes, okay, <laughs> um, but it, it honestly is the best and fastest way I have ever come to learn to use a screen reader. And that fear and the intimidation I had, it, it melted, melted when I started doing it. And I was like, hot dog, I'm, I'm tapping, I'm finding a heading. And so many great things came from that. Okay. Okay. Can talk about that. Okay. So what do we do in our cohort? Our cohort is based on the IT module. That's what teaches the screen readers. Okay, just so everybody knows. We also encourage everybody to use NVDA, Chromevox, and not just JAWS, right? We just say, have a laptop and get one of them on there. If everybody has JAWS, we make somebody get NVDA. We, we, we mix it up. Um, the, the next thing that we do is we meet weekly. We do this for about six to eight weeks, so not, not a long time. And we meet weekly. And in the cohort group, Remember, we're focused on community of practice. Too many teachers are feeling isolated. So for six to eight weeks, they can come meet with us weekly. And we talk about really, what does it mean to write good learning objectives, strong and effective learning objectives. Some of these seeds are planted from the IT modules, like with the do nows and different things. But sometimes teachers, we wanna build you a toolbox. So in our, these are in our synchronous sessions, we talk about that. So we, we don't make a goal bank, but we learn how to write goals that are rigorous and targeted for different types of students' needs. So we might, and we would evaluate this as a, as, a, as a team. So everybody has a partner in the cohort. You practice with them. You do a quick journal. It's an exit ticket. It's a little formative assessment. Um, and we get together and we talk about, well, how would you do an assessment? How would you develop a lesson plan? Now that you have the skill, remember, just because you have the skill doesn't mean you can do it. What are you going to do with the skill? And that's where our cohort answers that question. We talk about how do you write a, a rigorous and appropriate lesson plan for your students? 
what really is a good do now activity. And so when teachers walk away from our cohort, we've equipped them with that and the lifetime access to coming back to IT and practicing a skill. Something else that we do, which we started as a trial and it's really become probably the best thing is we, we do round table and teachers just share different barriers, things that they struggle with, you know, and we, we address it. And then we do um, stump the student. And so our assistive technology guy is totally blind actually. Um, so he's really not cheating us. He's literally doing it and he poses as a student. And then as a group, we teach him on how to use the screen reader, but we do it live as a group. And what's really great, it's such a win-win because you're not being called on one-on-one. -on -one. Oh my gosh, I forgot the method. How do I, how do I tap? doesn't matter. You're in the group. Everybody's doing it. The second thing, so if you're thinking about starting this for our assistive technology teacher, he's hearing live how student or teachers, the learners are learning how to teach this. And so he can coach teachers on how to tweak or be more effective and how they are providing instruction. Because if he's getting confused and he knows how to use it, our students are confused and they don't know how to use it. So um, we have this part in Google Classroom. It's really fun. We talk about assessments, how to write learning objectives, the lesson plans. So that's the cohort in a nutshell. If anybody really wants to get serious about this, I would fully support you um, and take it to your administrators and, and do it. Our, our administration jumped on and, and was really supportive of this. I would be happy to give you some advice, show you how we used it. Um, it was it was really helpful. And there was a lot of great things in IT that helped us out, the assessments that were already provided. So then what I worked on is how do you use assessment to inform your practice, right? That was the big one. Cause you, who cares if you took a test, if you do nothing right. with the information, it's just information. So that's a little bit about our cohort. Um, there is the teacher edition in IT and then there's the student edition. And so one thing that we did first is we got, we had all of our, we had our teachers do the, the teacher edition first and then um, digital literacy is our class. And kind of going back to that important part, screen readers are one piece of the puzzle, right? They're not everything. And just because a student has a skill doesn't mean they can do it or do other things with it. So in our digital literacy class, that's exactly what we do. We, of course, start first and foremost with the IT course, the student version, and we go through it. And then we move into digital literacy. And again, fortunate for me, I've got my, my own children at different ages. My own son is actually in a digital literacy class in his middle school. And so what do you think I did? Oh my gosh, open up. What is everything that your teacher is teaching you <laughs> in digital literacy so that I know what's expected of a seventh grader, what's expected of an eighth grader. That helps me to be current on what I need to equip my eighth graders with. Um, and so we have um, digital literacy. We then we, at a slower pace, we go through it. What Microsoft Word is, what is Google Docs? And then you really need to have screen reader skills if you're gonna understand these other ones. So we, we marry them together. Um, and so that's in our campus program. And then of course we embed it. If, if things aren't meaningfully happening, it's just, it's just information. So we do that um, in our program. I wanna highlight one other cool thing that we've also done. We did a short-term program. Some of you might be familiar with what that phrases are. It's after school, it expanded core enrichment. And I hosted something called the Digital Literacy Academy. It was a shorter version of what I was just talking about. That was another avenue that I was able to do to help students acquire skills and apply them, right? Apply them, not just acquire. And then our, our newest project that's coming from that, which I'm telling you this so that you see if it's an option where you live, is we actually started a flipped classroom digital literacy class where students receive academic credit because at least in Utah, and I'm sure in other places, taking digital literacy is a, a state standard requirement, but how can our students do it if they don't have screen reader skills, right? You can't use a Word document if you don't know the technology that makes it accessible to you. Um, so we have a new class where students receive time release in their day 
to take this academic class from us. It's co-taught again with our awesome AT guys. They're doing the screen reader technology. I'm doing the digital literacy part of it. But now instead of the expanded core being an afterthought or an after school commitment, we are embedding it in their school day because it's meaningful. It's in their part of their academic day. And we're able to put a little bit more ECC into that, just so you know. <laughs> um, but again, we, we, and we use the screen reader version from IT. Every student enrolled in it uh, does that part. And then we, we alternate between learning the screen reader skill and then the digital literacy skill. I hope that that gives you enough information about how we've done this. How do we do it in our campus program? How do we do it if you're, you've got kids scattered everywhere? We did it as, a, as an after school academy. And then the third leg of this now is now we're getting it embedded in a student's day into their academic day. So if you're listening to this, what I hope your takeaway is, is that there's options for getting this happening. And, and when I lived in Connecticut, I could get top to bottom and it was easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Utah, oh, three hours in, I'm still in this state. It's a big state and we've got kids everywhere. How can I have students in all areas of the state be enrolled and still receive this and I didn't have to travel. So if anybody's interested in getting this started, I'm happy to give away all my secrets. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> I'm happy to help you get started, um, tell you where our resources went, but it's been really, it's been really effective. Yeah, I love, I love too how, I mean, and this is like the dream for me is that uh, like we create something here at IT and you just took it and you extended it that much because you can only get so much from an online course. You really need that person-to-person -person interaction. Um, and as much as at IT, we're trying to, to be, kind of build that into the course in our, in our kind of future products, you've kind of already done it. And it's awesome because it's like, oh, I can see how the people in Utah, the students, the teachers can use what we're, we're doing, but also really get that above and beyond experience and walk away with with something that they'll remember and they'll retain for for years you know so um i i personally really appreciate uh that initiative um and i you know when we when i look at the things that we do at it i'm like oh utah that's that's one of our you know i love it um Kamran, do we have any uh questions that came up no, we actually don't have any more questions that came up. All right, cool. Well, I uh, let's uh, start wrapping up because I know we said uh, 45 and it's 47. So um, let, why, before we even stop, um, Robin, how can people find you? What are your Facebook, what's your Facebook group, your Instagram, oh, all that thanks. good stuff? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram and on Facebook at nine more than core, literally the number nine more than core get it because there's nine areas of the expanded core <laughs> curriculum um and if you you drop in on me on instagram that's really my favorite place to post because i post a lot of resources um a lot of day in the life activities it's also where you can get your link to our expanded core website um one of the things that we need to up our game with in our field i love everybody but we <laughs> need to up our game with assessment we say we're teaching expanded core. We say we're teaching assistive technology, but how do we know we're effective? And a lot of teachers feel that anxiety. How do you know you're getting the job done? Because we understand you love your students. You're committed to this field. And it's hard to feel like you don't know if you're, if you're making a difference. And so you can get your, cop, your free copy, free, of the expanded core high school readiness checklist. And it covers all the areas of the expanded core. It also covers students with multiple impairments in a one-stop shop. So go ahead and find me at nine more than core on Instagram or Facebook. I'm also at the Utah School for the Blind. You're welcome to contact me there. I'm kind of accessible in a lot of ways. It won't be hard to find me, um, but that's Robin with two Bs, R-O-B-B-I-N uh, C as in cat, at usdb.org, utahschooldeafblind.org. Um, but you can definitely find me on social. Happy to help anybody get started or do some professional development and we'll get you started with the cohort. Because the one thing I wanted to say about IT is it took the heavy lifting out. We didn't have to, our, our AT guys were already so busy teaching everybody all of these things. That was the heavy lift. So now if the teachers 
could be taking the classes, they could support that without having to recreate and recreate. And the other great thing about adopting it, whatever you choose, we, we've chosen IT. We are also creating standards of practices. So now, because it's our goal to get every teacher with students with vision impairments through our cohort, we all are speaking the same language. So when our AT guy tells this teacher wherever she lives, hey, did you try method one? That teacher goes, I know what method one is, right? So by doing this, we're creating common language. And then if the students are doing this, the teacher can say, I'm doing method one. But if they go to our AT guy, I'm stuck with method one. Uh -huh. And now the efficiency has just gone through the roof because we all speak the same language and we can find the patterns and our, our teachers can diagnose faster because they're not just shooting in the dark, hoping they understand what to do. And there's a pretty sweet assessment that comes in the IT um, course, just so everybody knows. I love it. And uh, we, we use it a lot. So I, I really hope everybody thinks about that. Um, little efforts make big deals. So, and, and our field has been trapped with some old, we've just been doing this, the things the way that we have, because that's how we've always done it. But it's, it's time, teachers, paras, interveners, administrators, it's time to change the way we're doing things because the students of today need us to be responsive to the world that they truly live in. And you, you can do it. I promise you, I promise you, you can do this. Yeah. And I love, I love when you say heavy lifting, because I, it's funny. Cause when you, when you talked about the assessment, I'm like that assessment, the ECC assessment that you created did the heavy lifting for me when I was assessing a student, because now all of a sudden I have a tool that I can, work from right before if you wanted to do an ACC assessment you pull out the big yellow book and mm -hmm. you're flipping through and trying to find activities that you can do and with that assessment it's like heavy lifting you can look through and be like oh okay I can assess that objective this way oh I can assess the objective this way um and it's it's really about like you said finding those resources that do the heavy lifting that bridge the gap where you're like okay now I can use my expertise to to get the rest of the way you know yeah um Cool. And well, I have one final thing that I just want yeah. to share specific about technology. I, I have great administration, very supportive ev everywhere across the board. High fives. Um, <laughs> nobody, nobody asked me to get better at technology. I was good before I did this. The reason I chose to learn technology to the level that I know it now is because I looked at what my students needed and I realized I hated it when we would be doing something and we had to stop the instruction because I didn't know the answer and I would have to stop and say well we better call Mr. Williams and see if he can help us right I I was it so I wasn't given extra compensation let's face it guys we're teachers right <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't really given extra compensation now my administration and everybody loved it don't get me wrong high fives but I wasn't asked but it was something I realized I hated that we had to keep stopping because I had to stop because I didn't know and so over the summer I called our AT guys who by the way were still working 12 month employees and I said Will you teach me? I started first with the Braille note touch. So patient. I just want to give a shout out to Quentin Williams because there were so many times that I was like, oh, shut up. I don't know. Oh, I was wrong. <laughs> so I, I want you to know I, I, I was a regular, I was a regular person who didn't know very much or anything about the devices. And I spent the summer, it got better. I kept practicing. I learned that you could plug your braille note touch with an HDMI cord into a screen, <laughs> which was a game changer. And so then from that point on, this is what it allowed me to do. Before, I didn't know if a document was really accessible, right? I, I guess that it was. But what it enabled me to do is I could open up instruction that I wanted to teach and do it on my braille note touch because I knew how to do it. Then when I moved on to screen readers, because once I tackled that mountain, I said, well, I suck at draws. What do I do next? And I, I got IT um, and I started learning. And in the wake of it, not only was I learning how to use a screen reader, but I was like, oh my goodness, I need to make sure that I always have headings on every one of my documents. 
because you can't you can't find Light it bulb, right no yeah. heading. right yeah. and so i went from i always being a good teacher right i was always a good teacher but now i knew i was an effective teacher when it came to technology and now every time i build a document it takes 2 seconds to highlight and click heading instead of normal text and so i know i'm building accessible documents when i built the ecc website I knew where to put things and I could test it myself, which was great. Now, don't get me wrong, Quentin and Quentin and Wayne, our AT guys are always in my back pocket, right? But I was empowered and I no longer have to stop at something so basic and say, well, let's go ask Mr. Williams. And I, and I became a partner with my students in instruction instead of teaching to them, which is not as effective as you think. Rather, we are learning the world together. I pull out my phone, we turn on voiceover together, I, or I hook up my Mantis device. I need help maybe to do it, but I can then do it and I do it with my students. And so, sorry, I know it's over time. And if you're bored and listening, I'm sorry, you had to hear that soapbox, but <laughs> I, was a, okay. I was a regular person. I was a, yeah. regular, I was a regular teacher. And in such a short amount of time, I was able to make some things happen. And I just want to empower everybody else. You can too, because it's worth it. Because this is the 21st century that our students, that they're in right now. And they and they need us to have that. So you can do it. And I'm happy to support you. Thanks. I for love that. it. Yeah. If we didn't get to your question, if you do have a question and we didn't get to it, still put it in the chat. We'll be able to answer it on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, but Robin, thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here and, and offering your perspective. And uh, we really hope that, uh, you know, we look to the future and, and find more opportunities to, to do stuff together. Oh, yeah. Awesome. I have your cell phone. I'll call you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. We love you all.